have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians today. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. While you're turning there, I just want to give you a bit of a recap of last week, especially for those new here. Last week I asked the question, why Baptist? You know, I asked you at the start of service of why you came to church this morning. Why you came to this church and if the kind of church you go to matters. Now we use two simple texts as the foundation of that message. And I just want to read those again for you now because those are really the the lens that I want you to be looking through as we cover today's message, which is why church membership? What is the reason for church membership? Why don't we just come and attend church? Why do we actually have to put our names on a member role? Why do we have to go through a process? These are questions that have come up quite frequently Recently, as you know, the church is growing. We have a lot of, of new faces here, a lot of new people, and this is a question that has been asked a lot. And so I thought it very important for us to talk about. Now, the two verses I'm going to share with you, this is in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. It says this. That thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So tell us in Timothy, part of what the church is. The church is the church of the living God, and the church is to be the pillar and the ground of truth. And in Jude uh, chapter 1, verse 3, it says this. It says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. In other words, he says, when I sat down to write, I had every intention to simply write to you about Jesus. About the salvation that we share. I just wanted to brag on Jesus for a while. But he says, it was needful for me to write unto you. And exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. He said, I wanted to brag on Jesus, but I felt it entirely necessary to exhort you, to encourage you, to push you, to contend for the faith, to defend the faith. Those two things, the idea of contending for faith, and the idea that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth is the lens that I want you to see the rest of this sermon in. So let's look, let's read our text in 1 Corinthians, and then we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll break it down and see if we can answer this question of why church membership. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 9. It says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, but not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then um, must he needs to go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Let's pray. Precious and heavenly Father, God, we thank you for bringing us here. We thank you for this time to just hear your word. God, as I sit here and present this message, I pray that these are your words and not my own. Lord, bless us, encourage us, convict us. 
or move in our hearts however you see fit. God, open our minds and give us a deep understanding of your word and soften our hearts so we will receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. So this passage, I, I, I'll admit, in the King James is a little bit more difficult to understand. So we're going to break it down for you because once you kind of understand some of the language of the King James, it really is kind of simple. As we talk about this idea of church membership, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, and, and he starts in verse 9. He says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. He said, there was once upon a time I sent a letter, and I told you not to do this. He says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must he needs to go out of the world. What he's saying here is he says, look, when I wrote that, I didn't mean the people in the world. If you didn't accompany with any of the people in the world, you would have to leave this world. And he explains it in verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company with any man that is called a brother, that is a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. Paul says, look, those people that say they're Christians, those people that are brothers in Christ or say they're brothers in Christ, but you look at their life and they say one thing and they're living another way. They say they're one thing and really they're another. He said, with those people, do not eat. Do not congregate. Do not associate. He continues in verse 12, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? He says, how can I judge those in the world? And then he asks another question. Do not ye judge them that are within? The translation here is, don't judge those that are in the world, but judge each other. And that's really what we're called to do as church members. That's kind of part of the reason why we have church membership. And it kind of points out the idea of church membership, being able to identify those who are of Christ or Savior of Christ. And if we are with a, a brother in Christ and we see them doing something that goes against Christ, we can call them out for it. We are supposed to call them out for it. But for those that are simply a wolf in sheep's clothing, so to speak, he says, put them away. Verse 13, but then that are without God, or without God judgment. Those in the world, leave that to God. God will handle those people. We are supposed to have mercy and grace to those people. We're supposed to show love to those people. We're supposed to, you know, I can't hold it against somebody for being an alcoholic if they don't know Christ. They don't know that. I have to teach them Jesus first and let Jesus change their heart and change their life when it comes to their alcoholism. Mm -hmm. I can't judge them for that. But that person who's running around claiming to be a Christian, wanting to be a part of the church, but is also living as an alcoholic, Scripture makes it very clear. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person, that wolf in sheep's clothing. You know, Jesus says it in, in Matthew, you know, he's cast out a demon and he's questioned and, and you know, the Pharisees said, oh, it's, it's by Satan, it's by Beelzebub that he cast the demon out. And, when Jesus formulates his response, he, he simply starts it with this. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided itself shall not stand. 
See, so when we talk about church membership, and we talk about it in the lens of the first two verses, that we are to defend the faith, contend for the faith, and that we are the pillar and the ground of truth, that means we have to be very cautious about who we let into our ranks. This is important for us. Church membership is there for us to contend for the faith. But why specifically church membership? I get this question a lot too. Why do we need church membership? Is it attending enough? Well, I come to all the programs. I'm in church every Sunday. When you tell me to pray for someone, I always pray for them. Why do I have to be a member? Is it becoming simply enough? And of course, I would argue no. Quite simply, no. And I want you to think for a second of, say, a marriage commitment. I want you to think of a young couple deeply in love. And, you know, when young couples are deeply in love like they do, the woman kind of whispers in the man's ear about marriage. Now, I want you to think in that situation where they get in this conversation about marriage and the young man looks at the girl and says, well, I love you. Isn't that enough? Why do we have to get married? Why do we have to commit ourselves? Can't we simply just be together? We can stay together. We can live together. We can have kids together. We can still have this relationship together. Do we really need a piece of paper? Do we need to commit ourselves? And we all know that a relationship that is, you know, scared of true commitment is weak. It's weak, and, and quite frankly, church membership is the same way. There has to be a level of commitment, and there's reasons for that. One of them is simply, I'll, I'll tell you, as your pastor, as the leaders of this church, biblically speaking, it tells us that we are your shepherds. That we are to lead you, to guide you, to discipline you. But for us to be able to lead effectively, we have to know who our sheep are. For me to be an effective shepherd, I have to know who I'm responsible for taking care of. Who has God appointed to me to shepherd? If there's no true commitment made, how do I know you're not just a visitor? That you're not just passing through that I'm not going to come to you and talk to you about something going on in your life and you're going to get so offended and so upset that you're just going to walk away, that you're just going to leave. That next Sunday, you'll be down the road at Brother Tom's church because you were unhappy here. See, a relationship without a true commitment is weak. Now, part of church membership we see in the book of Hebrews. I'm just going to read this verse to you, and then we're going to switch together to the book of Matthew, chapter 18. So if you want to switch to Matthew, I would recommend keeping a finger in Corinthians. But switch to Matthew, chapter 18. And while you're doing that, I'm going to read you this one verse in Hebrews. This is Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 17. It tells us, Obey them that have rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. <clears throat> so the book of Hebrews makes it very clear the responsibility of church members, which is obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves. And then it gives the reason, for they watch for your souls. 
And it says, let them do it with joy. Give them reasons to watch over you with joy and not with grief. Because if they're grieving over you, it's not profitable for you. And this is a responsibility of a church member and of the structure of the church, of the office of pastor, of shepherd, of leader that God has appointed in Scripture to be a shepherd. It's my job to watch for your soul. Now, I want you to imagine a family. A family, and they have a couple of kids, and there's a neighborhood full of kids, and they all get together and they play, and they're running up and down the street. But when dinner time comes and bedtime comes, you have to know which kids on the street are yours. You have to know which ones you're responsible for feeding, which ones you're responsible for protecting <coughs> that night. Which ones you're responsible for tucking in at night? For praying with at night? Church membership is the same way. Now I'm going to give you a... We're going to read this passage in Matthew, and I'm hoping that maybe you'll see it in a little different light by the end of today. Uh... Starting in verse 15, Jesus is teaching and, and he's talking about people who have conflict. And if there's conflict between one another, he says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Now there's a whole sermon right there about gossip and about um, just spreading rumors and, 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 you know, if I have a problem with Brother Brandon, I, I can't go to, you know, everyone on this side of the church and talk about Brother Brandon before I go to Brandon and talk about it. If I have a problem with him, I have to go straight to him and say, you know, Brother, you did this or, or this offended me. Can we talk about it? Right? There's a whole sermon right there. But it says, if you go one-on-one -on -one and he shall hear you, Thou hast gained thy brother. But if he doesn't hear me, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. They said, if you go straight to him and you can't bring resolution, you can't bring reconciliation, bring a couple more people with you to be witnesses. So words can't be twisted, so emotions can't get out of line. And talk to him again. And if he should have let to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So here we have a situation where if you have a problem with somebody, you go to them. If they don't listen, you take witnesses. If they don't listen, where do you take them? To the church. To the body, to the community, to the family. How do you know who to take them to if you don't have church membership? If you don't commit yourself to that family. In this, this whole reason for this passage is reconciliation, right? It's not punishment. When we talk about church discipline, that's kind of a scary thing for some people. And, and really, some people think, well, why would I join a church if that means I'm going to get disciplined all the time? You know, I don't want the pastor in my business. You know, I don't want them telling me what to do. I don't want the church looking down on me. That's not what Scripture says. Scripture says you'll gain your brother. You'll have reconciliation. You'll have peace. You'll have comfort. You'll have more love at the end than you did at the beginning. This is a blessing. Some people are scared to commit themselves to a church because they're scared of church discipline. They're scared of conviction. They're scared of what the pastor is going to tell them. Well, sure, I, I, I just want to challenge you to look at it in a different way. I want to challenge you to say, this is something God established to be a benefit for you. This should be a good thing. This should be celebrated. 
that you have someone, like I said in Hebrews, that is watching out for your soul. The work we do here has eternal significance. It's not just about your comfort here. I want to share a story with you. Um, before I met my beautiful wife up here, I quite frankly was living in the world. I was a weak Christian. I was a Christian. I, I went to church. I believed in God. I had been baptized, but I, I mean, I, I was weak. I still really wasn't living for God, and I was in a situation where I ended up moving in with the girl I was with at the time. Living together outside of marriage. And at the time, I was involved in a church, and I was um, working with the, the youth there alongside the youth pastor. He was kind of letting me shadow him, and he was mentoring me, and and so I was able to really develop this relationship with the, with the youth there. I, I loved the work and I loved the kids dearly. And when I went to the youth pastor, and at the time I was excited because I was in a really bad situation before I finally got this place with her. And I thought, man, this is what I needed to get out of that bad situation. And I went and I talked to him and, and I told him what was going on, and I received some church discipline. This man that I respected so much, this man that mentored me and loved me, sat me down, and he said, you're doing the wrong thing here. And what he told me was, if you move forward with this, if you live with this girl, outside of marriage, living in sin, I cannot let you work with the youth anymore because I have to contend for the faith. I have to watch out for their souls. I have to make sure they are getting good guidance and good examples. And this, these kids that I loved, this position that I loved, this work that I loved, all got taken away from me because of church discipline. And at the time, it crushed me. I understood why he did it, but it, it crushed me. But that was the single most loving act that any church member has ever done for me. It brought scripture to reality for me. It made it real. It made it to where it wasn't just something that I would go against scripture or go against God and I'd have a little bit of guilt over and the next day I'd be fine or, or I'd say a prayer and I'd be like, well, I prayed, I asked God for forgiveness, I'm good. No, it made it tangible. Honestly, for the first time ever in my life, the words written in this book became something more than just words. And it was in a situation where I failed and I got called out on it. But it was a blessing. It's what led me to turn my life around, truly turn my life around, truly live for God. <coughs> These are benefits of church membership. And benefits that we don't typically think of. Another thing involved in church membership is voting for things in the church. Now, I told you at the beginning, membership is contending for the faith. And we see scriptural evidence of this. We have uh, biblical guidance of how we are structured here at Shore Road Baptist. Now, in the chapter 1 of Acts, it tells us that when they wanted to replace Judas with a new apostle, that the leaders at the time appointed two men, 
Joseph, called Barsabas, surnamed Justice, and Matthews. And once they were appointed and presented to the congregation, at the time it tells us it was about 120 people, that they cast lots to see who would be chosen, and the lot fell on Matthews. Now what we have right there is a simple representation of the church, of church structure, of congregational say. That the leaders of the church looked at the people that they had, looked at the 120, they narrowed it down to the couple of people that was worthy of this position, and they presented two options to the congregation, and the congregation voted. So the leaders appointed, the congregation votes, and a new leader is established. Doesn't that sound familiar? That's exactly what we do here. It's a simple, you know, example. Now, coming up in October, we have, um, at the end of October, we have our annual business meeting. And at that meeting, we will have a congregational vote on the budget for next year. Now, that's not a very exciting thing, I know. But it's scriptural. And it's important that when that happens, that it's only church members that are able to vote on that budget. Now, why is that? Because we need to make sure that the voices being heard are people that have been confirmed to be converted, baptized, confirmed to have given their life to Christ, confirmed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, confirmed to not be those people <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians that it said to separate ourselves from. <clears throat> now I told you to look at all of this through the lens of contending for the faith and being the pillar of truth. So now when we talk about voting for things at the church, a thing that typically is overlooked or not really thought of as a benefit or an advantage or something of significance or importance. That is honestly uh, probably one of the most important things about church membership. It's one of the most important things that we can do as a body of Christ. Now, if we're looking at our annual budget and we're trying to decide how much money do we want to budget for outreach this year? How much money do we want to spend toward reaching the community, toward sharing the gospel, towards bringing people to Jesus Christ? Now, if we don't have church membership and anybody can vote, what's to stop a political group that doesn't like the church to come in here during our business meeting and outvote us, you know, a uh, hundred times, you know, and say, you're not going to put any money towards outreach this year. We don't want you to send people anywhere. We don't want you to talk to anybody in the community about the Bible. We don't believe in the Bible. We don't believe in Jesus. You're not doing outreach. Now, in the world we live in, that's a real possibility. It's an extreme example, and will it ever happen here at Shorter Baptist Church? No, probably not. Quite frankly, we're not in the limelight enough. We're not that special. <laughs> but you can see the possibilities. You can see why we have to have the safeguards. And you can see the benefit and the advantage. And when we're talking about building the, being the pillar of truth in the world, I mean, when the church is trying to decide what things going on in our culture are we willing to take a stand on and fight against, it's important that it's the right people making those decisions. When Roe v. Wade gets overturned and everybody's fighting over abortion, 
People look at the church to make a stand. Pick a side. We need to make sure we pick the right side. When the government is talking about what the confounds of a marriage are, the world looks at, looks at the church to pick a side. We need to make sure that we pick the right side. With all of the things going on in our culture and in our world, we are the pillar and the ground of truth. And we are the ones that are called to contend for the faith, to defend the faith. We have to defend this book, and to do that effectively, we have to have church membership. We have to know who is in our ranks. Imagine an army battalion who, who goes out to war, and they look around, and everybody is in the same uniform. They don't know who to shoot at, because everybody looks the same. They don't know who to take orders from, because nobody is dressed like a general. That would be the kind of confusing chaos that the church would be in if we didn't have church membership. So this may not have been the most exciting sermon ever. But it's one of the most important. And I thought it necessary as we have a business meeting coming up, and we have votes coming up, and we have changes coming up, and we have teams that we talked about that are coming up that we're looking for people to serve in. And we have all these new faces and new people that have been coming here for months. Some of you coming here since December. Before we have a moment where we need to vote, I thought it necessary to talk about church membership. I thought it necessary to remind everybody of why we have church membership. The insignificance, the importance, and to give you all the opportunity to step forward and say, okay, sign me up. This is why I take it so serious. For those of you that have been here a really long time, some of you raised in this church, and you didn't quite understand the process because you were born here, you were raised here, you were grandfathered in, if you will, You've been a member since day one. You may not think, of, well, why do we do this? Or you may be kind of lax on the rules behind it. This is why I'm so serious, because it's serious. And I'll tell you, early Baptist churches thought it so serious that before someone could become a member of a church, they had to take a two-year class with the pastor that it was a two-year process before someone was even considered to be a member of the church because they wanted to make sure that the people in their ranks were the right people. And that's exactly what we want to do here at this church. Let's pray. Precious and Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day and we thank you for your word. Lord, the faith that we are contending is is the gospel of Jesus. It's your life and death and resurrection. It's, it's salvation for everyone. It's the way you want us to live. <clears throat> so God, help us to live it out. Lord, we just thank you for your life. We thank you for bringing us here, for giving us a reason to be here. And as we move forward, God, I just pray that you will bless us. I pray that you'll continue to help us to reflect on your word that we heard here today. To reflect on this concept and this idea of church membership. To reflect mainly on this idea of contending for our faith. Protecting our faith. Protecting this book, this gospel. For being the pillar of truth in the world. Lord, help us to live up to that. We just put our lives in your hands. We put this ministry in your hands. We just pray that you have your way with it. In Jesus' name.